Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Oh, I love the anticipation of this moment. It has been 14 weeks since we have gathered on a Sunday morning. 14 weeks since we have lifted our voices in song and sat together under the word. 14 weeks since we have gone to church. And my heart is filled with thankfulness to God for his goodness to us in this moment and throughout this time. He has protected us. His word has continued to bear fruit in our lives. And he has now enabled us in his great kindness to gather together with our church family. These are among the 10,000 reasons that we have to bless the name of the Lord. Our sermon today is a life of thanksgiving from Colossians chapter 3 verses 15 through 17. A life of thanksgiving. Each one of these three verses in our passage mentions thanksgiving, this dominant theme that appears in the book of Colossians. And God desires for the hearts of each one of us to be abounding in thanksgiving. He desires us as a community, as a people, to be a community of gratefulness to God. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 15. This is God's holy and authoritative word. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father, through him. May God bless the preaching of his word. Many have observed that 2020 is the year that has gone from bad to worse. Uh, One of the trending memes is my plans versus 2020, uh, because this hasn't been what any of us had planned. Someone wrote a brief review of the year 2020 that gave it one star out of five and uh, simply said, very bad, would not recommend. Someone Someone else asked how they can cancel their subscription to 2020. And there have been other people who have expressed jealousy at the astronauts who left Earth, that they are the ones who are, in fact, winning this year and in this moment. Others are playing apocalypse bingo, finding that each month allows them to fill more squares uh, as events go on. Uh, Australia on fire, super volcano about to erupt in Yellowstone, impeachment trials, global pandemic, national lockdown, toilet paper unavailable, recession, unemployment, Olympics postponed, murder hornets invade country. Increased lawlessness, the love of many growing cold, and an asteroid hurtling towards Earth. What a year it has already been. And hear this in the context of this sermon in particular. It is appropriate to lament the difficulties of 2020. And I know especially in this cultural moment, our griefs are many. And yet as your pastor, who loves you and cares greatly for you, I want to give a word of caution and say, 
Let's make sure that we as a church family are not a people who grumble and complain, but are instead a community marked by gratefulness to God, a people of thanksgiving because we are a people who have been rescued by God and have been given 10,000 reasons to have thankfulness well up and overflow from our hearts in singing praises and thanksgiving to God. This will make us stand out in this world. We live in an increasingly negative culture. And as Christians, it is so easy to get drawn into the ungrateful and complaining spirit of the age with its constant negativity and whining and outrage and discontentment. Friends, we are called to be different. We are called to something better. We are called even today to a life of thanksgiving. Thanks, it is thanksgiving. It's more important than we realize. This is the path of blessing. Thanksgiving is the path to mental, emotional, spiritual, and relational health. It is the path to joy and contentment. Even more, it is the path to honoring God in all of life. G.K. Chesterton once said that there is no higher form of thought than thankfulness. And he said gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. What is gratitude? Happiness doubled. By wonder. Does your life, think now about the days and moments of our daily lives. Does your life know the regular experience of happiness doubled by wonder? Is your heart consistently filled and overflowing with thankfulness? Would those who know you well describe you as a grateful person? This is what the Spirit of God is accomplishing through the power of the Word of God in our lives here today. We have so much to learn from the Apostle Paul. Many people have watched the, the documentary of Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls and have been talking about how Jordan is the goat in basketball. That is, greatest of all time. He's the goat. Hear this. The Apostle Paul is the undisputed goat of gratitude. They talk about this, the scholars, in the writings of Paul. How no one else in history talks about gratitude with this kind of consistency. One of the defining features of his letters and his ministry and his life is the pronounced presence of thanksgiving. And you know, if you know the life of the Apostle Paul, this is not because his life was free of hardship and tears. Paul is writing this letter from prison. And he had known many beatings and shipwreck and danger, betrayal, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst. And yet he stands with Job who, when all ten of his children lost their lives in tragedy, said, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He was found praising the name of God. And he stands with David, who knew enemies from without and from within. King Saul tried to kill him. His own son Absalom attacked and betrayed him. Yet David so consistently, you see it all throughout the book of Psalms, says as he does in Psalm 138, I give thanks to you, O God, with my whole heart. I give thanks to your name and your steadfast love and your faithfulness. So somehow this life of gratitude and thanksgiving can find expression even in the midst of hardship and sorrow. And one of the reasons is because gratitude is not a mood. It is a God-centered approach to life. Verse 16 says we are to have thankfulness in your hearts to God. So who is thankfulness directed to? To God. Again, G.K. Chesterton once said, the worst moment for an atheist 
is when he is really thankful and has no one to thank. A life of gratitude is not mostly about saying thank you to others, though that is certainly important and included. Thankfulness is directed to God, and it comes from our hearts, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So our heart is to be controlled not by outward circumstances, but by the goodness of God. Our hearts are to be controlled, verse 15, by the peace of Christ that rules in our hearts. And verse 16, by the word of Christ that dwells richly in us. It may be that these recent days you have found that what reigns in your heart is not thanksgiving, but something else. Perhaps you find that anxiety is what has ruled and reigned in your heart. Well, remember God says in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. Here's what you can do with the anxieties that you carry even this day. In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer with thanksgiving is the way to attack sinful anxiety because thanksgiving does something for us. Thanksgiving remembers that God is in control. Thanksgiving remembers that God is faithful, that God is full of love for us as his people. You may feel today that you have little or no grounds for gratitude when you look at your life. You wish that your life was much different and tears are your constant companion. Friends, I do not minimize that pain and sorrow in any way. And yet I can tell you that however difficult recent months and weeks and days have been, whatever difficulties you have known, Christian, there is yet reason for thankfulness. Because ultimately, thankfulness is grounded in the gospel of Jesus Christ, which cannot be taken from us. You might remember Paul begins this letter in Colossians 1 by saying, we always thank God for you because the gospel has come to you. And he says later in chapter 1 that you can be strengthened with power for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. So you might say, nothing good ever happens to me. Hold on. Here's something giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness. So that's something, right? You've got something going for you. You have been delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have Redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. Do you have redemption? Do you have the forgiveness of your sins? Then give thanks to God with all of your heart. This gospel, this gospel of God giving his son to bear the judgment we deserve. He did it in his death. This gospel secures the free forgiveness of all our sins. And in this gospel, the good news of Jesus rising to new life to give us redemption and an eternal inheritance, this gospel is better news than our minds and hearts can comprehend. This gospel is the reason we should all be grateful today. And this isn't just, I'm not talking about, oh, thanks God. I'm talking happiness doubled by wonder. I'm talking about shouting for joy. I'm talking about what 
Chapter 2, verse 7, describes as abounding in thanksgiving. Not just, oh, he or she is a little grateful. There is an abundance. There is overflowing thanksgiving from our hearts because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has, see, God has not been stingy in his grace toward you. God has abounded in his great love for us and we, when we consider the staggering difference between the hell we deserve because of our sins against a holy God, when we consider the difference between the hell we deserve and the grace we've received, we cannot help but to abound in thanksgiving. This thanksgiving should characterize the whole of our lives. The whole of our lives. Our gatherings and everyday living. That's verses 16 and verses 17. Verse 16 is where we see that thankfulness should mark our public gatherings. There the people of God are addressing each other with the word, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Oh, friends, when we gather, we are a glad people. Don't we experience that gladness in our gathering? We are reminded that God has satisfied us with his steadfast love, that our hearts have been bound together in harmony. We have the peace of Christ ruling in our hearts. We are one body united in Christ. And therefore, when we gather, we are to sing as an outward expression of the thankfulness in our hearts to God. I have missed gathering so much and I can't wait until the entire church family is able to meet together as one, but we are getting closer. And this, being here with you, brothers and sisters, in this parking, who would have thought a parking lot could be such a happy place? This fills my heart with such gratitude to God. And it ought to fill each one of our hearts with thankfulness as we sing and as we hear the word. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says the physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. It's supposed to be that way. He says those who can't enjoy it due to imprisonment or sickness or exile view gathering with the saints as an unspeakable gift. But he says this gift, the gift of gathering, this gift is easily disregarded and trodden underfoot by those who regularly have the ability to gather. And so he says, let him who until now has had the privilege of gathering and enjoying fellowship with other Christians praise God's grace from the bottom of his heart. He says, let him thank God on his knees and declare it is grace nothing but grace, that we are able to gather with other Christians. Friends, what are we experiencing today? Grace. Nothing but grace. Thank God for it. Here's been one of my prayers, and I've been praying it not only for myself, but for all of us. My prayer is that what we have experienced in these recent months of being unable to gather would radically change the way that we view Sunday gatherings for the rest of our lives. I want to be, if I am still alive decades from now, having this experience of weeks and months without gathering shape the way that I think about the privilege of gathering, that we never take a Sunday for granted. We gather and we gather with thanksgiving and we thank God on our knees and declare it is grace, nothing but grace, that we are able to gather as a church family. But then we don't let thanksgiving stop there because verse 17 gives a vision for a life of gratitude every day and in all that we do, that thanksgiving to God should be present in all of life. Verse 17 says, and whatever you do, there's nothing you can do that falls outside the scope of whatever you do. 
And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This means we do not compartmentalize or limit thanksgiving to church or to prayers before dinner. Whatever you do (laughs) means everything and in all of life. Whatever you do means a constant daily awareness of grace. Whatever you do means every day, every responsibility God has called you to, and every circumstance should be an occasion for thanksgiving. John Kitchen, in his commentary on Colossians, has this beautiful sentence. He says, In the unfolding of our daily lives, thanksgiving should ever and always be permeating the atmosphere of all our words and works. That's Colossians 3.17. The unfolding of our daily lives, there should be an atmosphere. There should be something that permeates that atmosphere. It's thanksgiving. should always be permeating the atmosphere of all our words and works in every circumstance at all times times. Which does raise the question, does that mean what for difficult times, such as the days that many of us are in? This thanksgiving does not mean that we are happy about tragedies or painful events. Certainly not. It does mean that we trust Christ It does mean that we rest in the reality that Jesus is good and sovereign Lord of all. It does mean that we refuse to grumble or to doubt the unchanging love of Christ for us. We refuse to allow, this is what we must resolve, we will not allow difficulties and hardship to steal away our gratitude to God. No, we will have thanksgiving to God be present in all of life. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who helped hide Jews from the Nazis during World War II. She was arrested for this and placed in a concentration camp with her sister, Betsy. Uh, She tells that story in her book, The Hiding Place. And she talks about the misery. She talks about the seemingly pointless suffering In that book, she says, every day something else failed to make sense. Something else grew too heavy. When they were first taken to the camp, they were shocked by how awful, by how inhumane the conditions were. As soon as they arrived, fleas began to bite. And Corey was horrified. She said, this is awful. In that moment, Betsy remembered what they just read that morning as they had read the scriptures. And that happened to be 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, which says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And so in that moment, out of suffering and darkness. They went on thanking God for all the things that they were grateful for, even their circumstances. And at one point in the prayer, Betsy went so far as to thank God for the fleas. Lord, we thank you for the fleas. And, for, and Corey laughed it off and said, there is no way even God can make me grateful for a flea. In the days following, they were given much freedom in the barracks that they were in. Although many guards were around that area, there was almost no supervision in their barracks in particular. They didn't understand it, but it was an incredible blessing to them. They held worship services there with singing and scripture readings and prayers and Bible teaching as women gathered around. Night after night went by and no guard ever came close And they talked openly about God and the word continued to dwell in them richly and go forth in power. 
They later learned the reason they were given so much freedom in that place and the reason they had basically no supervision. You know what the reason was? The fleas. The fleas. Thank God for the fleas. You see, it was learned that the guards wouldn't step through the door of that place because they said the place is crawling with fleas. And Corey then found herself giving thanks in all circumstances, even for the flea-infested barracks. Friends, we don't know all that God is doing. We do not minimize the difficulties and challenges of these days in particular, and yet it needs to be said, and it needs to be known in our hearts that even in 2020, even during this pandemic, even during national unrest, we have reason to obey God's command to be thankful. Have we not experienced his protection? Have we not experienced his provision? Above all, have we not experienced the gift of God's own son, Jesus Christ, our Savior? We have been rescued by his grace. He has made us his people. He is working all things together for our good and for his glory. And therefore, what can we do but give thanks to this generous king? What can we do but live lives marked by gratitude and thanksgiving? Happiness doubled by wonder. Give thanks. Thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Say it to your heart today. Preach this message of thanksgiving to yourself. Give thanks to God, O my soul, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures, not just for a day, not just for a week or a month or a few years. He is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. We rest in that great love and we live lives of thanksgiving all our days. We are now going to remember and celebrate that love of Christ in the Lord's Supper, which we have been eager to experience again. To experience this means of grace that Christ has given us. The Bible says that communion is for believers only. So if you have repented of your sin, put your faith in Christ, we invite you to participate. The element should be in a bag that is near your cone. Uh, if you remove the, the top part, just the plastic layer, it's the thinner plastic layer, you'll see the bread inside there. And then if you peel back the entire thing, the, uh, uh, the silver layer, then the cup is inside of there. We'll take these together in just a moment. Although in the first service, they did say there was some challenge to accessing the bread, so you might want to get started on that. You got to get that thin plastic layer just as a, as a heads up. The word thankful in the original in Colossians 3, where it says, and be thankful, that word is eucharistoi, where we get the word eucharist, another name for communion or the Lord's Supper because this sacrament is a time for giving thanks. The celebration of the Lord's Supper is an act of thanksgiving for what God has done in giving us Christ, in giving his own son on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus would have us do this in remembrance of his death, in remembrance of his great love for us, that we might remember that we have this as the grounds of our thanksgiving in all of life. You may be aware of the sin of complaining in your life. As you look at recent days, this last week, perhaps even this morning, grumbling and complaining, the Spirit has been convicting you of. Well, friends, remember that the death of Christ 
forgives all of our daily complaining and unthankfulness. Our Savior took it all upon himself that we might know forgiveness. And his death not only forgives all of our complaining and unthankfulness, but also provides the basis for a life of thanksgiving, provides power and hope for change. His body was broken for you. His blood, the blood of the Son of God, was shed for you. And this is why our hearts can now know happiness doubled by wonder. 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's together eat the bread. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink the cup. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's proclaim the Lord's death with grateful hearts as the thankful people of God. Amen.